Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling, and today we're going to talk about the brand new documentary on former WCW World Champion David Arquette. It's called, as you can probably tell from the title, You Cannot Kill David Arquette, and it's all about his journey back into the murky world of pro wrestling. Now, when you're a wrestling fan and you hear the name David Arquette, you think of one thing. You think of wrestle crap, most likely. I mean, right? It's one of the most infamous moments in WCW history. This untrained actor coming into WCW, taking the WCW title, and, you know, lots of Vince Russo things. You've probably got a very strong opinion on it, even if you weren't there. But I promise you, if you watch even just 10 minutes of this documentary, you should watch the whole thing, by the way, because it's really good. But if you even just get a taster of this thing, your opinion is going to be changed. How is it going to be changed? Well, I'm going to tell you all about that. Now, quick disclaimer before we get started. Uh, this thing's 90 minutes long. Can't cover every single point in this documentary in this video. So we're not going to try to do that. Just cover the most important bases. And, you know, when I usually do one of these things, I often say... It's going to be in rough chronological order. We're not going to come up with some fancy ranking system, so keep that in mind as well. But now that we've got the blurb out of the way, let's dive in. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 things that we learned from You Cannot Kill David Arquette. Number 10. Wrestling Ruined His Hollywood Career. This one's a pretty interesting insight into how other forms of entertainment and the people within them view professional wrestling. There's Obviously lots of crossovers between wrestling and acting, but for the most part, we all watch this sport, right? We all love it, but it's pretty damn silly, and that's how a lot of people still view it. So when David entered wrestling, he talks here about how basically directors were like, what are you doing that for, you weirdo? Job offers became fewer and fewer. There's a spot where he's talking in his car, he's driving along, and he's saying, I've been going to 10 years of auditions, and I'm just not getting anywhere. I'm not getting any replies, because... When he entered pro wrestling and he's carting around this world title belt in WCW, directors just stopped taking him seriously. And when you think about that, even though he was on this magazine cover in the 90s, talking about him alongside like guys like McConaughey being the next big stars in Hollywood and going to be this, that and the next thing. But man, maybe David Arquette should have just been a wrestler all along, right? Number nine, doing it for the right reasons. There's a lot of talking heads in here, uh, wrestling fans and other people who just want to rip on David Arquette basically, call him a disgrace to the business, this Hollywood guy waltzing in and taking a world champion, he's disrespecting Ric Flair and Harley Race and all, you've heard all this stuff before and it's all here in the documentary and David Arquette doesn't want to come back to professional wrestling as some kind of weird vanity project to get his name back in the headlines, he speaks about this openly throughout. It's about clearing his name. It's about changing that perception. It's about not being seen as a stain on a business that he truly loves. And he really does love this business. That's one of the biggest takeaways from this documentary. Just him pouring out his enthusiasm, his passion for this that he's had for the duration of his life. Uh, basically, there's a bit here where a clip from a DDP shoot interview where he's like, you know, David never wanted to be world champion. He knew immediately he'd be seen as this just black mark on the sport for just waltzing in and going above locker room etiquette and breaking the unwritten rule. And man, it just paints him as such a sympathetic guy. And watching this stuff, it's really hard after you've seen it to take the stance of, oh, screw David Arquette, wrestle crap, all this stuff. Him winning the world title definitely wasn't good, but this reframes it completely. Number eight, the murky world of backyard wrestling. There's a part in here where David just gets conned by a carny promoter. Uh, he's trying to get back into the business. No one will give him a lifeline. This guy calls him up, Chris Harris, I believe his name is, books him for a convention, books him for one of the biggest promotions on the East Coast. <sighs> it's a guy in his backyard. <laughs> literally conned him into doing this thing. The promoter admits it himself, to be honest. He sits there and he says, look, hey, listen, I lit you up. I'm not going to pay you. Uh, I told you some lies, but this is the business. And there's shots of him working this backyard match. It's dingy. There's weapons everywhere. Nobody's in shape. People talking about respecting our craft. 
two minutes in, the ring breaks because it hasn't been set up properly and it kind of ties in with his preparations as a whole because before that you see him, uh, sorry, just after this, you see him training in this really small training school and he comes in all laughs, all smiles, thinking maybe it's going to be quite easy. Gets his ass handed to him. He's bleeding on the backyard show. You wouldn't expect someone with genuine name value outside of pro wrestling to go to this extent, but really highlights his love for the game. And again, I don't know how anyone could possibly look at this afterwards and still sneer when they hear the name David Arquette in a pro wrestling context. Number seven, David's Mexican excursion. So David goes to Mexico to train. He wants to do this the proper way. Like we've said, he wants to get good at his craft. And part of that is going to Mexico to learn from some luchadors. So we see him working out, running drills, training with these dudes. And part of this is literally wrestling in a traffic jam. Crazy, I know, but these guys are running through some moves, they're doing some exchanges, it's really cool stuff in front of stopped cars for tips, and when David does it for the first time, he kind of makes a pig's ear of it. He goes around for tips, he's at these car windows like, hey, can I have some money? And all he gets is a few high fives, maybe a couple of dismissive waves here and there, watches the Mexican wrestlers do it, learns, adapts, does a dive off a crazy ladder in the middle. You have to see this stuff to believe it. But the key message is he turns it around. It's a key point of the whole documentary, in fact, but he does it, he nails it, gets his tips, wins the trust of the wrestlers who were really frustrated before, and he even earns himself a lucha mask from one of the participants after working an indie show. It's like a big six-man tag. It's crazy. It's all over the place. And it's clear that this was a very important part of his training. And also, you know, on top of that, Watching guys wrestle in the street, one of them's David Arquette. How can you not have fun with that? Number six, Helping Hands. A pretty cool thing about this documentary, and this isn't one of the deeper points, but whatever, is learning the people who helped him along the way, the people who trained him. We see him working out in his back garden with uh, Peter Avalon of AEW. He's wearing a GoPro, so it's a really cool perspective as they're running drills and stuff. Uh, Tyler Bateman, who currently works for Ring of Honor, is another one. But the biggest name of all in all of this is Diamond Dallas Page, that wrestling saint himself. How many people has that guy helped get off the floor and get back on their feet? Well, he does it to David, and it's the most Hollywood thing of the whole goddamn documentary. They're doing yoga on the beach, they're working out, there's this instrumental music, there's crazy camera angles and stuff. It's a really cool part of the documentary, man. And, you know, when you think about it, of course DDP had a role in this. They did stuff together in WCW. Uh, DDP's just a really good dude. Makes a lot of sense. Number five, he had a heart attack one year before coming back. This is crazy, right? So David's sister is being interviewed uh, on The Ellen Show and she just casually reveals during this when they're talking about David that yeah, he'd had a heart attack prior to coming back and Ellen's mind is blown by this. She didn't know, I didn't know. You can assume that you guys didn't know as well, maybe. Who knows, a lot of you are smarter than me so maybe you did, but it's just kind of mind blowing to think about that when you see the extent, the measures that David is going to, the punishment he's putting his body through after recovering from a potentially life threatening situation. Man, you know, watching it, the guy was just so goddamn dedicated to this craft that how are you not sympathetic for that? He's a little bit crazy, David Arquette. He's uh, extremely dedicated, but he really loved what he was doing here. Number four, David was living his best life. So in the second act of the documentary, when it really starts turning the corner and the progress and the training starts becoming apparent, David's flourishing, man. You see him working with guys like Bully Ray, Timothy Thatcher, Billy Corgan, Tim Storm. I'm sure I'm missing a few. Uh, we've got a feud with uh, RJ City in Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. It's just really heartening to see it all paying off, man. He loses 50 pounds, he quits drinking, he quits smoking, he gets himself into the best shape of his life. His wife, Christina, calls him a superhero. Just heartening to see that level of dedication paying off and it's all accompanied by big bombastic editing and music and it's really well played as a whole. And let me tell you, man, my heart generally is the color of my t-shirt, but I felt a little warm from there, man, and I thought that thing was incapable of such feelings, particularly for pro wrestling. So. If it does it for me, man, it's going to do it for you as well. Number three, David Arquette versus Nick Gage. This is where things take a dark turn. 
You might have caught coverage of this in the past. Uh, when it went down in 2018, it got lots of coverage, like major outlets that don't normally cover wrestling were on top of this. It was a death match. GCW show, Nick Gage, the king of death match wrestling, who before the match promised death and destruction to David, and that's what he brought. Um, this is insanity. It's crazy. It's out of control. There's light tubes, there's chairs, there's tables. The most worrying spot of all is when Gage gets a broken light tube and literally just stabs Arquette in the neck. Uh, it's pissing with blood. It's gross. Clips from the likes of Brian Zane calling it one of the craziest things he's ever seen happen in the ring. Uh, Jim Cornette shooting on it. David finishes the match to his credit. He gets taken to the hospital, he gets treated and all this stuff, but there's a clip from the Joe Rogan show of uh, Jake Roberts when he was on it and they're both just like, what are you doing, man? What, what's going on here? Go back to your day job. And it really signals the start of a darker chapter in this documentary and it's really hard stuff to watch. Um, not necessarily a match you need to go out of your way to see. You get everything you need to from the documentary here, but gee whiz, like, the stuff that this man <laughs> went through for his art just to clear his name. In there with Nick Gage. Nick Gage is a very scary dude. Just look at him, for God's sake. Fair play, David. Fair bloody play. Number two, the true impact of the death match. In the words of his wife, Christina, David's life really started coming unglued after working the Nick Gage match. The impact of it went more than just the physical trauma of getting stabbed in the throat there. His best friend, Luke Perry, who drove him to the hospital, the father, of course, of uh, AEW's Jungle Boy, passed away suddenly, just out of nowhere. Devastating impact on David's psyche, his mindset. Everything, all the hard work just kind of started slipping away and Christina says here that she didn't know, you know, one year he had a heart attack, two years later he had the death match and a year from now, would their marriage be intact? Would, uh, would he even be here to be with her? and their, their children. In Christina's words, and David's words as well, he was an effing mess. But did he turn it around? Did the documentary, did You Cannot Kill David Arquette end on a happier note? It did. And at number one, Randy and Elizabeth. Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth are constants throughout this thing. They are who David always goes back to. We see him watching them as a kid, uh, lots of clips peppered all over the place. He loved Randy Savage. He has a conversation with an indie wrestler in a van on that way to that uh, backyard show I described earlier. And uh, he's like in love with Miss Elizabeth when he was a kid. And in a really nice moment at the end, when he starts getting back on track, everything comes full circle and he's invited to the Legends of Wrestling show that Brian Nobbs kicked him out of previously. Christina shows up dressed as Miss Elizabeth and it's just really nice symbolism. They're both happy, they're both just at peace with what's been going on, and it wraps the whole thing up in a nice little bow. Randy Savage that night imbued David Arquette. That's what he wanted all along. You see him winning the respect of this crowd, thousands in attendance in this arena. Uh, Booker T, nice symbolism there, of course, a legendary former WCW champion. He's won his respect as well holding his arm up in the ring. He's named in the PWI 500, uh, you know, like 19 years after winning the WCW title. It's a happy ending to a happy story that had a lot of trouble along the way, man. Like the parts of this documentary that go into the health problems David had, I haven't even been able to cover those, but man, there's some heavy, heavy stuff there. But it's nice to see him emerging from the storm, a rainbow ahead. Happy endings. You don't get many of them in pro wrestling. This is certainly one of them. Anyway, guys, that's it. My take on You Cannot Kill David Arquette. And like I said at the beginning, we couldn't fit everything in this short little video. So I wholly recommend checking out the documentary for yourself. We've honestly barely scratched the surface here. There's so much good stuff in here. It's a great documentary. You're going to love it even if you're only vaguely aware of what happened with David in WCW. It's a great watch. Check it out if you can. And once you've done that, let us know what you think down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. And then, of course, you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at Andy H. Murray, where you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.